Uh, good morning. Uh, this is uh, Professor Marsh and this is Unit 9 uh, in uh, Principles of Management at Newbury College, Fall of uh, 2021. Uh, this is going to be uh, Chapter 9 in the 10th edition uh, of your uh, textbook and Chapter 10 in the 11th edition of your textbook. Uh, so uh, we're making some progress here, uh, and uh, uh, I think as of this lecture, uh, we will be back on track uh, with the uh, uh, with the syllabus. Uh, the uh, the learning objectives for this particular chapter are uh, the to learn and the uh, explain the focus and goals of organizational behavior, uh, attitudes and job performance. Uh, to uh, learn about personality theories, uh, perception, uh, learning theories, and shaping behavior, and contemporary issues in organizational behavior. Uh, there's a lot of practical psychology and behavioral science in this chapter. Now, I have to say that uh, the first course that I took uh, when I was in college at Bucknell University up in Pennsylvania uh, was personality theory. And Bucknell at that time was known for having an excellent uh, psychology department. <clears throat> and this was the, you know, the premier freshman course for aspiring psychology majors, which is what I was at Bucknell. And it was team taught by the foremost prominent professors in the Bucknell psych department. Uh, one of them taught Freud and his personality theories. One of them taught Jung and his personality theories. Uh, one taught B.F. Skinner and behavioral uh, science, uh, and I've forgotten who was the first, fourth personality theory that we studied. Uh, I ended up not becoming a psychology major. Uh, so the prominent professors walked into the first day at class, and in retrospect, they kind of looked like extras from the first Star Wars bar scene. Uh, and I got out of the psych department by December and became an English major. Uh, I then switched to political science, ended up in a double major in poli-sci and economics. Uh, sometimes your personality indicates that you're going to be flexible and adaptable, uh, I guess. But one thing I found out for certain is that I didn't want to be a psych major. So uh, psychology is an inexact science. Uh, but uh, there are aspects of psychology that you can apply to your work as a manager that are proven and tested and scientifically verifiable. Uh, and that's what this chapter attention, attempts to teach you. So we're not going to make you into psychology majors, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to identify uh, some of the practices that can help uh, and demonstrably help uh, in dealing with issues that involve organizational behavior. <clears throat> so what are the focus and goals of organizational behavior? Well. The focuses are individual behavior, group behavior, and organizational factors. Uh, and the goals of organizational behavior are good goals. I mean, they are, they are positive, favorable, you know, ethical goals. Employee productivity, <coughs> reducing absenteeism and reducing turnover. Uh, organizational citizenship behavior, being a good citizen, um, the, either, the, you know, in the in the organization or perhaps uh, the helping the organization be a good citizen in the community. Uh, high job satisfaction and dealing with, you know, workplace misbehavior. How do you deal with <coughs> when there is uh, workplace misbehavior and there inevitably will be, how do you deal with it uh, in an ethical and appropriate manner? Now there are visible and hidden aspects of organizational behavior. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I guess we're going to have to go back to the psych department after all these years, but uh, some people think that this part of management is manipulative. Uh, I think it's just taking advantage <clears throat> of some scientifically valuable traits to help your employees and the organization succeed. If it's coercive or manipulative in a negative way, pretty soon people are going to find you out and you will disillusion them. And if you're in a large organization, <coughs> when they find out, <laughs> they will become whistleblowers. Uh, they will go to the Office of Civil Rights with uh, QUITAM actions, and uh, if you're breaking the law, 
uh, try to collect that bounty uh, for misbehavior. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a, uh, <coughs> you know, or, or they'll quit, or they'll quit, and you'll lose somebody who otherwise could have been a good and productive employee. Uh, so individual behavior, looking at that, at that focus, it includes topics like attitudes, personality, perception, learning, and motivation. Okay, all interesting topics. Group behavior includes norms, roles, team building, leadership, and conflict. <clears throat> and the organizational aspects we're going to look at uh, with respect to both individual and group behavior are going to include things like structure and culture, uh, HR policies and practices. The goals of organizational behavior are virtuous. You know, just look at them. Improving productivity, reducing absentee and, and turnover. Organizational citizenship behavior <coughs> is discretionary behavior that promotes the effective functioning of the organization, even if it's not part of the formal job responsibilities. Helping other team members, volunteering in the community, avoiding conflicts, staying positive, cheerleading, those sorts of things. Uh, <coughs> things that demonstrate a positive attitude and can generate high morale in the organization. Job satisfaction is a very important concept. Highly satisfied employees are more easily retained, show up on time, and show up prepared, and they're more productive. Organizational be behavior, uh, OB, seeks to minimize and hopefully eliminate workplace misbehavior. In the 10th edition of the textbook, the photograph in illustrating job satisfaction is of a research scientist at Gilead Sciences, a biotech company which developed several of the compounds used to make up the AIDS cocktail that kept HIV patients like Magic Johnson alive for all these years uh, since the early 1990s. I have some experience, maybe secondhand, once removed from Gilead because they were a top client of one of my clients uh, uh, many years ago, a contract research organization that was at the forefront of the fight against AIDS in the 1990s and which was able to use the expanded access, compassionate use approval of the FDA to fast track these compounds, first to a network of community doctors investigating and treating AIDS patients in clinical trials and secondly, to get the full ADA approval <clears throat> in only two to three years instead of the 10 years that it traditionally uh, takes under the, uh, the three-phase uh, FDA approval process. Uh, patents uh, for new drugs only last for 17 years from the date of discovery. Uh, and so all the phase trials that they go through uh, counts against that 17 years. So <clears throat> a company like Gilead that gets its drug approved for sale to customers in two to three years <coughs> instead of seven instead of ten years has seven to eight more years to exploit the patent before the generic manufacturers can hone in on the business with cheap substitutes expanded access compassionate use trials create networks of thousands of community doctors and hundreds of thousands of AIDS patients or at least that's the experience that my client had uh, in the clinical trials receiving these investigational compounds, which created a built-in market of thousands of purchasing patients as soon as full approval was received by the FDA. <coughs> Economically and ethically, it's a powerful model. Uh, and, and quite frankly, it was what uh, Operation Warp Speed that developed the vaccine uh, for COVID-19 <coughs> tried to both follow on and uh, improve on. And if you remember, the uh, uh, Trump administration had a goal to develop the vaccine uh, by uh, uh, the end of 2020, uh, you know, within a year. And in fact, they, the vaccine was developed uh, within about nine or nine months, nine or ten months after the beginning of Operation Warp Speed. Uh, you remember, you may remember that uh, uh, the uh, famous uh, uh, public health official, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, who was at the forefront of the expanded access programs 
uh, to uh, uh, deal with AIDS. Uh, he was in, he was he was at NIH and and uh, uh, also uh, was important. Uh, he was an important advocate uh, for AIDS research in the 1990s, which I think is why he is so beloved uh, by people in the public health community. Uh, but uh, uh, he was he was famous for saying that he thought it would take two to three years uh, to develop an AIDS vaccine. Uh, and I think that was probably, I mean, to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, I think that was based on his experience uh, with AIDS. Uh, so uh, in any event, uh, uh, I, I have some experience uh, with that. But uh, uh, the, uh, I guess the, the point of that uh, is that uh, um, the employees at Gilead Sciences uh, you know, have high job satisfaction, and because of the, that high job satisfaction, uh, you know, obviously they're very productive and, and very innovative in developing um, very helpful drugs. Uh, attitudes and job performance. Uh, let's move on to that. So, uh, <coughs> evaluative statements uh, uh, concerning objects, people, and events. Uh, there are three components of an attitude. Uh, cognition, effect, and behavior. And uh, let's look at what attitudes employees uh, hold, might hold. And uh, consistency. Let's look at the consistency between attitudes and behaviors. Uh, then uh, cognitive dissonance theory, which is sort of the inconsistent uh, attitudes and behaviors. Uh, and managers and employees' attitudes. How, how can managers deal with employees' attitudes? Uh, so when we're talking about uh, cognitive, uh, we're talking, that's made up of beliefs, opinions, knowledge, and information held by a person. Uh, and then affective attitude, that's a emotional or feeling part of an attitude. And the book gives you an example of Brad and his thoughts about smoking. I think that's a pretty good example to explain uh, how all that works. And then behavioral, uh, so uh, an intention to behave in a certain way based on the cognitive and affective influences. So, <clears throat> you know, you have an experience that, uh, you know, your mother smoked in the car and it made you sick, and uh, uh, the way you feel about that is when you see somebody smoking a cigarette, you feel a little sick remembering that, uh, and in your behavior you decide that, uh, you know, you really don't want to hang out or, or be involved in a relationship uh, with people who smoke. So, anyhow. Uh, that is the uh, that is the uh, attitude and behavioral uh, construct. Uh, attitudes that employees might hold, uh, job involvement and organizational commitment, are both very helpful attitudes to find and to cultivate in employees. Uh, that leads to employee engagement, uh, which happens when employees have high job satisfaction and enthusiasm for their job and organization. The top five factors leading to employee engagement are these. Respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Aretha was right. Type of work, the work-life balance, providing good service to customers, and base pay. Okay, so this is what uh, science has found, <coughs> psychological science has found, are the top five factors leading to employee engagement. Now at the other extreme, cognitive dissonance, this is incompatibility between attitudes and behavior, uh, and it was identified by a, a researcher, uh, uh, academic named Leon Festinger in the 1950s. <clears throat> that can lead when you're when you're you have certain attitudes, but you have to behave differently be, because of the situation. It can lead to guilt, pressure, alienation, bad behavior, substance abuse. Uh, and, and all sorts of other negative uh, consequences. Uh, the benefits of managers understanding attitudes are measurable and practical. Uh, higher productivity, lower absenteeism and late, le uh, lateness, and less conflict at work. <clears throat> now let's go back to my personality theory class and look at personality theories. Uh, per your personality is your natural way of doing things and relating to others. That's relatively simple. Uh, your personality is a unique combination of emotional, thought, and behavioral patterns that affect how a person reacts 
to situations and interacts with others. <clears throat> now, what is your personality? Well, they actually have tests for it. Uh, one of the most uh, widely used is the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. Uh, and uh, uh, I have gone through that, uh, and I am a, uh, an ENTJ. So uh, uh, that means uh, uh, extroverted, intuitive, uh, thinking, and judging. And uh, I worked at a firm where we all took the Myers-Briggs test. And uh, uh, based on being an ENTJ, if you read the book, I'm supposed to be an organizational leader. And uh, uh, our boss had a personality that uh, supposedly made him a good candidate to be a, a heavy machine operator, uh, and he wasn't very happy about that. Uh, but uh, uh, <coughs> the, uh, there's, there's, four, there's four axes. Uh, uh, there's extroverted versus introverted. Do you, do you process information internally? That's introverted. It's not that you just, you know, you never talk. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of how you, how you process information and what you share with others. Uh, or do you think out loud? If you think out loud, you know, and, and maybe you have a more outgoing personality and are willing to share more with others, then you're an extrovert. So I'm close to the line, but I'm slightly extroverted, which is good for somebody who does a lot of public speaking. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, are you intuitive or uh, are you sensing? Uh, intuitive people uh, tend to uh, uh, think non-linearly. So uh, they are people who you know, maybe have brainstorms and epiphanies and uh, jump uh, to a conclusion, where sensing people tend to be more methodical, more disciplined, uh, more, you know, step-by-step -step, uh, in the way uh, that they uh, process information and, and make decisions. Uh, are you thinking or feeling? Uh, are you, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, thinking and feeling. So the ultimate, uh, the uh, the icon for thinking uh, is uh, Mr. Spock on Star Trek. Uh, that is not logical, uh, I guess was one of his favorite expressions. Whereas feeling people kind of, they make, you know, they might make some decisions based on, you know, how they feel about things. Uh, so uh, they tend to be uh, more uh, interpersonally oriented and uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, care more uh, about acceptance of the outcome by all. Uh, less likely to create conflict, uh, whereas the thinking person just kind of says, well, this is the right answer, so that's that. Now, <clears throat> I was very high on the thinking uh, part and, and very low on the feeling part, uh, which uh, has helped me uh, try to develop uh, my uh, feeling side when I have to interact. Uh, <laughs> see, you're a judgmental, right? Uh, yeah, I'm a J also. So, uh, when I have the wonderful opportunity to interact uh, with other members of my family who are more uh, feeling on that dynamic. And then judging versus perceptive. Uh, <coughs> now, the scores go from 1 to 75, and judging versus perceptive. Uh, judging are people uh, who have a strong, uh, you know, almost Old uh, Testament type of uh, uh, sense of what is right and wrong. Uh, and who uh, uh, don't cut a lot of slack. Uh, and I'm uh, sort of a weak J on that, but I'm uh, more of judging than a perceptive. Uh, perceptive people are more of a go with the flow. Uh, and uh, uh, I certainly uh, uh, can understand that and uh, try to cut a little slack whenever I can. However, my daughter took the test, and my daughter was a, she was a J75. Uh, you know, she, uh, uh, she would be a very tough judge, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, appear in front of, uh, and, uh, so, uh, that's, uh, that's a, uh, uh, she's not very flexible about things, uh, that she thinks are important. Uh, and, uh, why do we use the Myers-Briggs personality, uh, test and, and personality theory? Uh, we do it to try to create work groups uh, that have complementary skills, uh, but also to understand uh, that uh, in dealing with other people, if you're dealing with a J75, an argument to just give me a do-over uh, and cut me some slack <laughs> is not going to work. Uh, they expect you to do what you promised to do uh, and to do what you ought to do. Uh, <clears throat> and so if you're 
crafting an argument to try to persuade them uh, to get on their side, <coughs> get on your side, uh, you might want to do it in, in terms of something uh, which is uh, defensible under the rules of the game, uh, as opposed to arguing for an exception. Okay, let's look at perception. That's the next topic in the materials. Uh, perception is a process by which we give meaning to our environment by organizing and interpreting sensory impressions. And the uh, section starts out with those famous pictures that look like, you know, two totally different things depending on how you look at them. Is it a young woman or an old woman? Uh, is it two faces or is it an urn? Uh, is it uh, uh, a, uh, a knight or is it a horse? Uh, so, uh, you know, those are, uh, you know, kind of like Rorschach type things. You know, what do you see in these pictures? Uh, there are some quotes, and, and actually there's one that's, that's uh, pretty good. <clears throat> None of us see reality. We interpret what we see and we call it reality. Uh, that's, you know, you know, perception is reality. Perceptual influences include uh, the perceiver, the object being perceived, and the context. Um, so... Uh, <coughs> Um, how do managers judge employees? Well, you've got attribution theory, uh, internally versus externally caused behaviors, distinctiveness, <coughs> consensus, and consistency. Um, you can have a fundamental attribution error. You can have managers uh, who think they see something in an employee, but that's not actually um, the reality, uh, that they're looking at certain behaviors and, and to the manager it indicates that the employee perhaps um, you know is lazy or avoiding work whereas the employee and I think this is one of the examples in the book was actually just thinking carefully about it and trying to organize and make a decision because maybe they weren't as intuitive as the manager maybe they were more sensing uh, and wanted to take you know all the steps necessary uh, to uh, uh, make a good decision or to take the action that was necessary. <clears throat> there can be self-serving bias uh, in which, you know, people kind of, you know, they see things from their own perspective, and, and a lot of times that's very self-serving to their own. Uh, that is particularly found when they're evaluating their own mistakes. Uh, there's a lot of self-serving bias. You know, well, it wasn't my fault because this happened and that happened and this happened, you know. Uh, and then there are perceptual shortcuts uh, that can be uh, very misleading as well that you want to look out for. Selective perception, assumed similarity, stereotyping, and the halo effect. Uh, so, And you certainly see a lot of that in practice. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, because perception is reality, uh, what this makes clear is it's important to confirm what you intend to convey or how, how what you intend to convey is being perceived. So you want to confirm that. You want to ask questions <coughs> of employees, customers, to confirm understanding. And you've probably heard that term before, but you want to confirm understanding. So what you're saying is this. Or so what I'm proposing to you is to do this. Uh, and this is what I expect of the process to involve. And this is what the benefits will be. Uh, and so make sure that the message that you intend is the one that is received. And be aware of the common misperceptions that people are prone to make, uh, the ones that we just went through with some of those shortcuts. <coughs> okay, on to learning theories. Uh, operant conditioning. Uh, this is like the B.F. Skinner behavioral theory where, uh, uh, you know, you see the, draw, the dog training picture in the textbook at, uh, you know, section... Uh, 9-5, you know, you ring the bell and the dog starts salivating because you trained him uh, and gave him a treat every time the bell rang during his conditioning. Or I guess that was Pavlov, but in any event, not, not be a Skinner, but same, same process. Uh, social learning theory. <clears throat> this is learning through both observation and direct experience. <clears throat> Managers can use conditioning and learning to shape the behavior of their employees in ways that most benefit the organization. And managers can help and coach employees to learn to become better and more productive workers. And, and that's the point of all this. Okay, what are some of the contemporary organizational behavior issues? Uh, well, certainly the generational differences in perception between all the different generations. I am a 
baby boomer, and uh, then we have uh, Gen X, Gen Y, millennials, uh, and there's a discussion in the book of Gen, Gen Y perception. <coughs> uh, another contemporary organizational behavior issue is negative behavior in the workplace and uh, how to deal with it. So, uh, um, you know, the rudeness, aggression, violence, vandalism uh, can result from the failures of managers to understand perceptions, especially when employees perceive their, their supervisors are hostile, abusive, and uncaring. Uh, so uh, this is it for Unit 9. Uh, next time we will move on to Unit 10. Uh, and right now we should be caught up in real time uh, with your syllabus. Uh, so this uh, lecture is taking place the week of <coughs> October 18th. Uh, so uh, please do uh, keep up with your reading. Uh, if you haven't watched the previous videos, go back and watch them. Uh, maybe watch them while you're looking at the PowerPoint slide so that you, you know, not only learn what you hear, which remember, we know that we only remember about 20 to 30 percent of what we hear, uh, but you can read it also because we remember maybe 60 or 70 percent of what we read. Uh, so uh, that should reinforce one with the other, and you'll find uh, that uh, my uh, notes pages uh, with my PowerPoint presentation contain a lot of information, uh, you know, probably pretty much most of the script, maybe not what I'm doing right now, uh, but uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, if I ever mention uh, that there are some outside sources, a lot of times I have uh, the uh, URL uh, for that outside source that uh, you can just click on uh, or perhaps copy and paste into your browser uh, and find uh, what it is that I'm talking about. So. Uh, certainly a lot of the old TV shows and movies that I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> you might find a five or ten minute video that's instructive uh, by following uh, those links. Uh, so have a great day, and we'll see you in Unit 10 next week. And uh, uh, feel free to uh, contact me if you have any questions about uh, the course or any of the requirements. I know that we have a number of uh, uh, assignments that are due this week, uh, uh, major one of our first major papers, and also a short uh, review quiz. Uh, so uh, uh, have a great day, and we'll talk with you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.